All right, this next video, we're gonna talk about something a little bit different, but it is related to the idea of making your research more reproducible and easier to, to read and understand and come back to and revisit later. This topic is the style for how you code in R. So R is very forgiving about the format that you lay the code out in terms of things like indentation or spaces or pieces like that. But if you make some thoughtful choices about them, it does make a big difference in terms of how clear it is to read, how easily other people can read your document, and then how easily you can read it later. So we're gonna go through some R style guidelines. These are just some rules for how you format the code in a script. People develop different styles and you can look through the code on GitHub for a variety of amazing R programmers, then you'll see some differences in style as you look through those. However, there are some rules that I think um, a larger and larger group of people tend to follow now, and it really does help in making your code clear, and it'll help it look kind of more in line with some of those other documents as well if you get in the habit of doing that. So I put some of the advantages here I see for trying to follow some guidelines when I code. Uh, first of all, that code is easier to read and interpret later, which again is very important because the whole reason for scripting something instead of going through with point and click is, is to be able to go back and redo it very easily and very clearly later. It makes it easy to fi fix and catch mistakes. So I think many of you have noticed that a lot of times we'll get these mistakes from the syntax. Like we just forgot to put a plus sign at the end of a line in a ggplot call, or we're missing a parenthesis somewhere. So those details become easier to catch when you use a consistent style. Um, it also helps other people to follow and read your code more easily. And there are a few cases where these guidelines will help in preventing some possible problems. So there aren't a lot of examples of this in we'll, what we'll cover today, but one is um, avoiding using a period and function names, because sometimes that is something that's used to separate um, a method name and then an object name as you get more advanced into some of the kind of like object-oriented programming in R. We'll use two style guidelines from this. We'll mostly be relying on the style guideline that Hadley Wickham has put out in one of the books he's published. So I put a link through to that if you'd like to read the original there. And then also we'll be using some of Google's style guidelines for R. And Google's gone through and for every programming language, I believe that they have uh, programmers working in, they have a guideline that's used across the team to allow for consistent style across all the members who are jointly working together on projects. A few of these we've already covered in class, but I want to come back and remind you of these now that you've had the chance to process some of that earlier stuff we talked about. So one of them, even though you can use an equals and a gets arrow for assignment, we are in this class going to use the gets arrow. So I do ask you to do that. Later when you leave, you're welcome to pick whichever you would like to use, whichever you prefer. But I do recommend that you, you remain consistent. So whichever you pick, you use that consistently. We've also talked about guidelines for naming objects. So we talked about rules, and if you break those rules, like if you start with a number, R will not let you do it, but there are also these guidelines. So using all lowercase letters or numbers, so you don't have to remember which parts were uppercase and which parts were lowercase, since again, R is case sensitive when it's looking at those object names. Then to use an underscore to separate words rather than camel case or a dot. And then also, um, this is one that I think we've been trying to work towards in this class. Um, you want to name your objects with names that make sense, things you can come back to. But every now and then you'll make an object that you just need for a minute to check something. It might be kind of a throwaway object. And I think it's helpful to have some consistent names for those. So some of the ones I'll use is like DF as a generic name for a data frame or EX or A or B. Uh, some people will use foo and bar and actually different languages ha have generated different ones that they consistently use if they're writing, if they're making a little object that they just need for a moment, but it's really kind of throw away for them to check something. It's not something that they need to be able to remember later what it was. So I think that in maybe Italian, it's the names of Disney characters. Um, anyway, I do think it's helpful to have some consistent names for those. So if you like Foo and Bar, that's fine. If you like EX or A or B or something like that, that's good too. But that way you can go back in your code and when you see those, you know that those are just things you were using for a moment moment and it doesn't matter if you get rid of them or overwrite them or throw them away. For the, for the objects that are important, you do want descriptive names. So that includes the object names themselves, but also things like your file names. So you want to make sure that you have descriptive names for your scripts that you're using. 
Um, another suggestion that I think does help make your code better, especially as we start moving into this next section of the class when we're going to start learning how to write functions, is to use noun type names for objects and then to use verb type names for functions. So for example, if I had a vector that was a list of the people in the class today, I could do today's group as the name of that object. But then if I wanted to write a function that would assign you into random groups, then I might name that function make groups. It's got that verb in there. The next suggestion is to keep your lines to 80 characters or less. And this is pretty consistently advised across different programming languages. The reason to do that is because once you do that, even if it means having to have some, some indentation and some line breaks inside your R expression, it means that you can read it all at once. Um, if you don't do that, then you'll often get the case where you have lines of code that are going off the page. And so if you're in our studio, you keep on having to scroll over. And again, it just makes it hard to, to catch cases where you've got a syntax error, where you're missing a parentheses, or even just to see in one kind of like one glance everything that you're doing uh, with that particular piece of code. So this 80 characters line actually comes from um, from the history of computer science. So computer cards uh, used to be 80 characters. Let's see if we can pull that up. Yeah, this should work. So um, all the coding used to be done by putting the code and the data on these cards that look kind of like this. And you can see, you can actually see even up at the top of this example, these had 80 columns. So we've kind of kept that idea of trying to keep things to 80 columns when we code. In our studio, one way that you can check to make sure that you're doing that is you can actually set one of your global settings. And I've got it set here, but let me open a script so you can see it a little bit more clearly on a script. Right over here, I have a line that shows me when I'm getting to 80 characters. So I know if I'm going beyond that, I need to do a carriage return or somehow reformat my code so I can fit it inside that range. And you can see this is about as wide as we want to keep our, our window anyway. If you go to Tools and to Global Options, this allows you to change a lot of your overall options about RStudio. And you can go into Code and then the Display. This allows you to show a margin when you're getting to a certain number of characters, and then you can set how many characters you want that to be, and I would advise you to set that to 80. It will let you go past that as you're typing, but again, it, it lets you see when you're getting to that point. The next code style point is on spacing. When you use binary operators, you should have a space on each side. So just as a reminder, binary operators are these special types of functions that instead of having the function name and then parentheses and the arguments inside those parentheses, instead of that, you only have two arguments and the function actually goes in between the two. And these are really useful when you're doing things like assignment with the assignment arrow or the plus sign or a negative sign for subtraction or even the pipe symbol. For all of those binary operators, you should include a space on either side of them. Um, so here's an example right here. This is what not to do. So here we have an assignment arrow with no spaces around it and then um, a division with no spaces around it. Instead, you want to include a space on either side of this. Now, it's really important to remember that you can't have spaces inside them if they're more than one character. So like the gets arrow or the pipe operator. Um, you need to keep all of those characters together, but you want to put these spaces on either side. I guess the one exception is when we do extraction with square brackets or with the dollar sign, you don't want to put any spaces there. Um, the other thing is for colons. So I guess that's another exception here of an operator. For colons, you don't want to put spaces on either side either. When you get to commas, you should have a space after, but not a space before. So I've got the correct up here, but then down here I'm showing what that would look like if it were incorrect. So it would be incorrect either to put no spaces around them or to do any combination where there's space on the left side and not space on the right side. 
Another point, um, this might be something that you didn't even realize yet, but you can put two lines of code on the same line and call them at once. And to do that, you need to put a semicolon in between. So this is doing the assignment of the numbers one to 10 to the object name A, and then just the number three to the object name B. These can all go on the same line, but you really should avoid that if you at all can. Um, it's, it's a little hard. You really definitely get in kind of the mental framework of at least one line per R expression. And so when you start doing this, it becomes really hard to go back through your code and suss out where the different expressions are starting if there could be one that's starting halfway down the line. The next point I wanted to make is about commenting. So you can make a comment on its own line, and for that you just use a hash. Most of you have practiced doing that. Um, you can also put a short comment at the end of a line of code. You don't want those to go past that 80, 80 character mark, but you can put that in if there's just a short thing you want to remind yourself of that goes exactly with that line of code. You can also use these code comments to create larger sections in your script. And so to do that, you can start with a hash and then you can put your comment, but then you're free to put any other punctuation mark that you want that's going to help you visually see that, for that to visually stand out when you look, to, look at your script. So a lot of times people will do things like put a, a very long row of hyphens after, and then you can see that whole line that's, that's marking off a certain section. For indentation, this is another case where it can really help you immediately visually see where things are happening in your code, where new function calls are, where pieces are nested. So within a function call, you want to line up your different parameters if you put them on different lines. So if you have a long enough kind of part that goes inside those parentheses that you need to break it across several lines to get within 80 characters, do make sure that you're lining up those different calls. If you have a call inside, like here we've got kind of male and female in this concatenate that's inside the labels, then this you would want to line up if you put these on new lines. So you would want to go down and have this female line up with the male if you needed to do a line break in that part as well. R is not like some other programming languages that really care about indentation and are using that as a marker for where things happen. This is really just something that makes it easier for you to see it. It's also very helpful to group related pieces of code together. You can do these with empty lines to separate different sections and also with code comments to help you identify where sections are. Um, so in this example, there's a section that's loading the data where it's uh, loading the library with the data and then using the data called to load the, the data itself. And then it's got a next section that's doing another piece in cleaning up that data and getting it ready for analysis. A lot of this grouping does happen naturally when you use piping because you tend to do these tasks together in one long pipeline of line of code and so that visually gets set by itself. Finally, there's just a few broader guidelines. We won't use these a lot this week, but they are things we'll talk about as we move later in the class and start talking about how to write your own functions. Those are to admit needless code and don't repeat yourself. The more you find yourself copying and pasting stuff, the more likely that, that um, if you need to change something, you're not going to find every place you copied it to make the change exactly the same. And it also becomes this very long script where it takes you a long time to get through everything. So we're going to start looking at places where you're doing the same thing again and again with just slight tweaks in your code. And later in the class, we'll start transforming that into functions where you can make slight modifications through the parameters to the function call. But really, you are only expressing that, that main body of code in one place and then just calling it a lot of times later.